Pickett's as well, and how important that was, and how this young student, Sadhu Singh Dami, that's the author, Sadhu Singh Dami, uh, came here as, you know, as, as basically a child, and he, he settled here, and sort of his experiences. So, so it's an interesting book. They, it was actually written in Punjabi, but then it was translated into English, and it's hard to find a, a, a paper copy, but you can find it on the internet, on script and things like that. So you can find it in some spots. But it's an obscure kind of book, but it's really interesting reading. Um, and if I were to see Justin or uh, John or Gregor, uh, I think I'd be um, a little bit more in your face. I would ask them. Um, so every year, there's a Vasaki parade. Um, you know, there's one in Surrey and there's one in Vancouver and there's a stage that's set up and it's run by the Punjabi Market Association and every year all these politicians, they come on stage, they make speeches, they come dressed up, they're shaking hands, but yet they're not really kicking in the money to help beautify the market or help put up some of these murals, to help put up some of these, uh, these things that people want to commemorate the market. And over the years, I did speak to the, the former president of the Punjabi Market Association. He goes, for years, since the 1990s, they've been asking for all these different things that could attract people. And one of the, one of the things that they had asked for was uh, a map. They wanted uh, Tourism BC to help out with this, where they would have a map of the ethnic markets. And that would be around the Olympics. So people would have this map from Tourism BC of some of the ethnic markets that they could visit, the Chinatown, Punjabi Market. Um, all these different places, Commercial Drive, uh, however that didn't happen. So there were different little initiatives that they wanted to happen, but they didn't really happen over the years. So I would ask these politicians, you know, why aren't you doing anything? You come here and you want to celebrate with the community, you want to shake the hands, but yet, you know, what are you doing? Are you commemorating the community? Are you honoring that community that you're here, you know, trying to garner votes from? things for um, Chinatown. Um, to add to that, I would say also, um, uh, don't um, reduce Chinatown to um, Chinese. It's not. It's actually an incredibly diverse community. Um, uh, I <laughs> Like, what am I trying to say here? Um, going back to sort of, um, I really believe it is like a sanctuary neighborhood, that we still have migrants coming over. We still have vulnerable people coming over. We, we need people who need to access services. Let this be the space for them to do so, you know? Um, let this be the space where people are welcome. And let this be the space where uh, it, we can truly like have representation of diversity within Vancouver, and that we have the right to the city, and not just the right to go to some suburb and <laughs> stay there, you know, so that we can turn Vancouver into something else. And it, it, those kinds of histories belong in the center of Vancouver, right? Physically, spatially. Yeah, very much so. Um, I, I, you know, uh, just res responding to that a little bit before I, 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 I move forward, um, and, and you know, you're, you talk about the erasure in, uh, in Kitsilano. The, the other day I was looking over some statistics of like demographics in Vancouver, um, and it really struck me how even though this is a city that is uh, uh, as Andy puts it, a majority minority uh, city, or you know, where um, white people don't necessarily make up the uh, the, the majority um, in the uh, in the city, that there are neighborhoods that are starkly white, and Kitsilano is one of those. It's almost a four to one English um, as the uh, spoken language to non official, so official language to non official language is almost a four to one there. And it's just above two to one in Granby Woodlands area, and, and and I was like quite surprised by by that statistic, and um, I was thinking about well, what are the consequences to Chinatown? Because throughout the sort of center area from Granby Woodlands through to um, 
through to the west of, of Vancouver, uh, you have either one-to-one -one or majority white situations. And then it's around the periphery where, uh, you know, like a, a um, uh, Fraser View, um, South Vancouver, is like four to one the other way, um, it, you know, quite, quite starkly, or something, something of that sort. And so I start thinking about, like, well, what's happening to Chinatown? And how is this particular marketing that's happening around the condo sales and stuff in, in Chinatown, you know, producing the type of erasure that, uh, that, that, that you're talking about? So yeah, like just acknowledging the kind of reality of that, um, of that threat with new developments. Um, but yeah, if I, if I were to meet, meet those guys at Newtown, um, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would probably congratulate Gregor Robertson on making Vancouver a distinct place in terms of its transportation experience. I love Vancouver as a transportation experience. I love the bike share. I like the bike lanes. I love the car share stuff. You know, I love that there's a sky train that takes me out to you know my house in Burnaby. I, I like that stuff, and that makes a distinct place. But then, you know, I would challenge him as I would challenge the others to um, to go. Okay, you did something. You had a distinct plan, but there was a um, there was a, a color blindness or a, a, a blindness to that city greening, that green city initiative, and it like for it, it, it forgot about cultural diversity, right? Maybe it paid some homage to biodiversity, but it completely forgot about the cultural diversity of our city. And so it's like, can't you plan for you know that diversity to be um, celebrated, embraced? Um, and, and to make it so that these spaces are, um, are aggressively inclusive. Um, and then maybe to John Horgan, I would say when, uh, you know, maybe, Mira, maybe you've got a, a good idea. Uh, when Christy Clark would go under junkets, trade junkets and so on, maybe one of the things that, that John Horgan could do if he chooses to do a similar thing is to go, who can invest? And, and to work with communities to say, what businesses do you want to come into the Punjabi market? You know, who do you want to invest you know, several hundred thousands or a million dollars into, uh, into that area? And help to, help to bring those kinds of uh, investments uh, forward. Um, and then at, at, the, at the federal level, um, I'd say, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau, like, what the, hu what, what the heck is up with, uh, with housing? We need real housing investment make it happen, and then you have some type of public investment in housing, in neighborhoods all over the place, and when you do that public investment in housing, there's a way that you can shape how those um, developments take place that can perhaps be more inclusive, and I think those would be the ways that I would um, address those guys. Maybe, I don't know, I, I, yeah, I should think about it more. But. <laughs> Just to add to that, it's really interesting the ways in which um, uh, policy supports, and policy and funding supports some initiatives and others it allows to go the wayside. Um, so if anybody took the tour before this, um, Kevin and Bob were talking about the parallel food system in Chinatown and the, the ways in which nobody cares about the green grocers in Chinatown and the affordable grocers there, yet we all, like, there's so much funding going into supporting farmers markets now, right? Um, and that's supposed to be sort of like the green kind of local produce, you know, let's consume that. And, you know, like, you know, when my mom came to uh, Canada, you know, she sure wasn't really enjoying you know, farmers markets in the same ways because she was the one that was going out to pick the strawberries that, you know, uh, instead of going to public school, right? Like someone actually had to tell her, actually, you're a child, you should be going to school. You shouldn't be going to the farm, like, picking strawberries. That doesn't make sense. So like, it, like we, some things come into vogue and are supported because a certain middle class set enjoy that, right? And we let other, you know, things like green grocers in Chinatown go by the wayside and we don't support those things, so. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I think right now we'll... Thanks for your reflection. I very much enjoyed the commentary by the panelists. Um, I'm wondering 
So we recently saw a lot of youth activism around what the future of Chinatown can and should look like. Is there anything parallel for the Punjabi market? I'm just wondering where activism for that area might come from. Well, uh, well, uh, you know, I, actually, I was reading about different ethnic markets before before this panel, and uh, there was. There were some articles done by the New York Times and NPR, and in one of them, it discussed the, the soft and hard approaches to dealing with um, gentrification, right? And so one of them, so the soft approach is working with the developers and working with the city behind the scenes and trying to make change come about. And then the other one is the hard approach. It's more the activism, it's the protests. So the Punjabi market, you know, there's only about a few, there's basically it's a much smaller market. It's, it's, a, it's basically a few blocks. And what's happened there, uh, there's a lot of empty nesters. So there's a lot of people who are, you know, they've been in business for 40 years. Uh, they want to cash out. They've made a lot of money. Now it's time to retire. Maybe they're, there's that also that generational shift that, that we haven't really discussed, but there is a generational shift where people want to cash out, they want to retire, they want to sell their business or their house in Vancouver, they want to move to Surrey, buy their own business, you know, set up their kids, give some money to their children. So you see that happening. So you don't see that, that, that I guess, that, that will, you don't see that grassroots effort of, of activ activism there. And a lot of it is because the Punjabi market, a lot of people did, did leave the Punjabi market by, let's say they started leaving uh, late 1990s. And so you still have businesses there, but with some of the business owners there are also the younger ones that are there, like Rawaz, they're younger. Um, they haven't been there for so many years. So you don't quite see that sort of activism and you don't see those protests. But there was activism behind the scenes. There have been a lot of people trying to, to make some initiatives go through, but they never did. They lobbied governments, and they have been. Now they're hoping, you know, um, in government, we're going to have to reach out, or maybe he'll do something. He knows the city. He knows how things work here. Um, but you just, you just never know. So behind the scenes, they're using the soft approach, I would say, with the Punjabi market, rather than the hard approach. Yeah, absolutely. I think I would echo that. I mean, definitely there's, um there's, there's involvement um, from young people for sure, and it comes in, it manifests in different ways. There's, um, we started with the Roots Cafe, right? That was just um, Simran and her husband um, who decided that, you know, we're running a successful cafe. Uh, I think it was on commercial, their first one, and then they said, uh, we care about the Punjabi market, we grew up in this area, and we want to do something. And they started Roots Cafe, and it worked, right? Um, and you're, you're seeing young people get involved. Um, early on in the stuff that's kind of um, inevitable, right? I think, um, and then you're also seeing kind of some efforts from uh, young people that are involved over at the Khalsa Dewan Society on Raw Street. They're making efforts and there's people working with the city. But there, yeah, so there hasn't been kind of that, um, there is activism, right? I don't just define activism as, as protesting, though I'm, I'm very happy to get involved with that as well. But, um, it's, it, there's activism, but it, it is, I think you said, it's kind of an exhortation of soft power um, and getting involved uh, before this becomes something that needs kind of, you know, that, that hard approach. Any additional questions? Can I ask a question? Oh, oh sorry, oh, someone, okay, just, okay, someone okay. just beat you. Okay, all right. Uh, the gentleman to the back. Like the back row Inquisition here, or something. But I'm closer to the doors. <laughs> I just wondered what you, you, how you would respond to people who say, "Well, that's just the way it is." Like, you know, commercial drive's not very Italian anymore. You know, Broadway's not very. I'm not saying I would agree. People say that Robson Strasse isn't Robson Strasse anymore. That this is progress or it's natural. So, what you see would be the difference between what may be happening to Chinatown and the Punjabi market in terms. Of with that kind of that kind of response, of people saying that's just the way it is, that's progress, or that's the natural, whatever. Uh, can I jump on this one? Yeah. Is that okay? Um, so my, uh, you know, it, it always irritated me growing up um, hearing my father talk about the the natural march of progress. Um, and yesterday, yeah, yesterday, um, I finally put that into a picture. 
I went to the Gene Autry Museum in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in California, in, in, in LA, and there they have the painting, The Angel of Progress. And the Angel of Progress is this bright white angel with um, telegraph poles and trains marching behind her with settlers in their wagons coming, and before them are uh, indigenous people fleeing. <laughs> And that, I guess, was a poster that was used quite um, widely back in the, in the early 1800s to speak about this, you know, the spiritual warfare that is, um, that, that is going before us as we, as we sweep out the heathen. Uh, and so I, I have a, like, a real problem with like, those ideas, and I think we need to reject them. And, and, and to say, no, um, progress is, is, progress is like maybe moving forward, but it's like we are active in what we construct and we need to be self-conscious of that and we need to assess and reassess our values and our ethics as we do those things. And we'll make mistakes, but we really need to ask ourselves hard questions and not just be like, well, you know, I guess Chinatown was moving along, you know, it, no, it, like, no, no. Um, yeah, I could go on, but I won't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the invisible hand isn't so invisible, you know? Uh, it's, I mean, um, it, like all, um, some folks were here for tour earlier. Um, and uh, there were some moments when we were talking about, it wasn't said, but it, people were talking about the effects of institutional racism. Um, for example, um, the barbecue meat shop protest, the ways in which there was um, food safe regulations, that food had to be kept under certain temperatures and barbecue meats didn't meet those temperatures, so they were shut down and um, these, you know, barbecue meat butchers had to go all the way to Ottawa to get them reinstated, um, which is, you know, a rid ridiculous length to need to go um, to demonstrate that your food is safe. Um, but food safe demonstrates institutional racism, right? It's a example of regulation that's colorblind, but it begins to exclude um, certain people's foods, right? That are clearly safe if people are eating them <laughs> and not getting sick, but it's not considered institutionally food safe. And so similarly with many different policies that don't say, oh, you people can't have this. It, policies are never written like that. Policies are, you know, neutral. <laughs> And then some people start to slip through the cracks, and then you, you start to see which groups slip through those cracks. And they are largely maybe poor people, indigenous people, racialized people, queer people, you know? Um, and they seem like not really offensive policies if um, you're not the person who doesn't fit in those categories, right? Um, so I would say similarly that we need to watch for those kinds of things, right? So on the tour today, um, we looked at some of the new condo buildings with the wider frontages. And what is the harm in having wider frontages in Chinatown? It kind of seems neutral. It kind of seems like something that like anybody can be part of those stores. Anybody could rent, lease those spaces. Why are you saying that that could potentially lead to institutional racism, right? But what that leads to is that there's a certain type of store who's able to afford that space. There's a certain type of leasee who that um, the landlord will accept in that space. There's a certain aesthetic to which they want their building associated with, right? And so we begin to have these practices that seem very neutral and seem like the invisible hand free market, let the free market take its course, don't worry, like it'll take care of everyone, when in fact it doesn't. Um, and so we just need to be wary of these things that seem to be neutral but are not.
Lindsay, the woman right in the center. Oh, what? Oh, sorry, was there one more? Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, I guess then. Hi, uh, really appreciate the insights from the panel. Um, in the case of Chinatown, I was wondering if, um, uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, Innovation Boulevard, and sorry, unfortunately, the other one I knew of, um, the innovation conversation to, you know, just make it a little excessively urban planning-esque, um, is one that I find interesting, uh, coming at an interesting intersection to this uh, question about um, these neighborhoods, uh, especially since technology itself has such issues with diversity already. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if um, there's any counter narratives or, or um, interesting things that you've seen to really undermine or transform that the innovation narrative that's happening around places like Falls Creek Flats in Vancouver um, that might actually be able to be inclusive and diverse and acknowledge a lot of the issues that you're bringing up. Um, Okay, uh, well I just feel bad like, talking so much. Um, the, uh, so Richard, do you know Richard Florida? Um, so he wrote a, a book called The Rise of the Creative Class, um, which is like, uh, which drove a lot of this sort of uh, uh, creation of these innovation strips or tech hub type neighborhoods, which was, uh, you know, maybe even take an area that is already a little bit diverse, um, invite in artists, invite in um, other, other sorts of groups, and then your technology companies and so on will come, will come in. And if you look at the Vancouver Chinatown Revitalization Plan, some elements of that uh, sort of thinking were in there. Um, and it's de devastating. It's completely devastating planning. It was total error. And um, Richard Florida himself has gone back and said, oops, we've screwed affordability, we've screwed diversity, this was a mistake, and it's his own. Like he's he's going back and critiquing his own ideas now, um, and uh, I just so much policy is still built around the original uh, creative class. Oh my God, ideas. so much. And Richard Florida has debunked Richard Florida. Yeah, and, and Richard Florida is debunking himself, and he's not. I don't think he's doing a thorough enough job in his self debunking. <laughs> um, but at least he's headed in that direction, and I, and and I think, and I just hope that that memo gets got far and wide. Um, but, you know, it's already almost too late in some places. But like, come on, like, yeah. All right, we have two last questions. Oh, Mira is one of them, but Lindsay. Hi. Um, this is a question for Tyler because I just want to point out something, and I, it partly uh, an excuse to say something sort of blunt about politics because I don't. Um, feel as, as if it's something that got said, and that is that uh, I guess I question the idea that developers aren't demons. <laughs> um, and I, I'm saying that because, I, you know, if there is anything, if there is such a thing as a demon at all, in the current context of, of the Vancouver economy, it is that. It is real estate development. The, the development at Kiefer in Maine is incredibly cynical. I live very close to there on Kiefer. I've seen the changes in Chinatown. I've been there for 15 years, and um, so that's that's just a starting point, an observation. Okay. I just noticed a contradiction in two things you said. One is that you're optimistic about further development in Chinatown, and second, you notice that there's a the, the the angel of history and the idea of progress is a faulty one. So I think it's important to decide which side of the fence one is on mm. in those two observations because they're contradictory, okay. and I think that. Um, I'm a pal of Tyler, so yeah. I'm not okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's okay. It's be outside in the night, so, <laughs> so next fundraiser for the not to make it too, too long, but I, I do think, um, as sort of a housing activist myself, uh, it, it's become very obvious that um, a couple of things. One is that uh, rent for either residences or, or businesses in new buildings are infinitely more expensive than they are in older ones. Um, as someone who's also written about history in Vancouver and, and that, that touches on architecture, I think something people don't really understand. I mean, heritage is a really useful tool because it, it maintains these buildings, but it can't just be for architectural purposes. It, it, as an architect once explained to me, even if a building isn't that lovely, um, you know, perhaps like the one the Goldstone Bakery is in, um, or, or, or
or some of the other ones in Chinatown, which um, Bob Rennie remarked on in a recent interview as shitty Rembrandts. You know, not the best of, of the paintings that Rembrandt did so they can go. The problem is, as this architect uh, described to me, it's not so much about the architectural quality of a building, it's the habits that the community has built up around that place, like the sense of place that you were all talking about. Okay, sorry, I don't mean to go on so long. I'm just saying that, that all new development not only is going to eradicate those habits that the community has built up, and that is, community is a very fugitive thing in this age of property development. I mean, we're seeing it. it is, we're seeing a total erasure of your communities and many others. So, are they demons or not? <laughs> because how can you possibly uh, not see that the new, whether the frontage is small, which it should have been in Chinatown or not, are, are, are simply not going to function in the same in the same way, and there's so little left. Okay. So, yeah, progress or not? <laughs> progress or not, <laughs> demons or not. Um, well, thanks for the question, Lindsay, I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, no, I do appreciate it, I really do. Um, the, I, I, I will say, um, I agree, I agree with you, like, we do need to um, maintain a diversity of buildings, and, and why throw, like, I think the, sh the shitty Rembrandts are great. I think we should keep a lot of shitty Rembrandts, um, because they, they offer us so many possibilities, right? And they also offer, like, one of the things about um, an incomplete um, piece of art, or a piece of art that isn't the masterpiece, is that it it, it it opens up the idea the, the mind to possibility, right? It just as in a building in a neighborhood that may not be like the some architectural masterpiece, it reminds us of, of the possibility that might be in that space. And it also facilitates possibility because like you say well, let's us do something. Yeah, exactly. It keeps the it, it keeps the values up. Now, um, do do things get built? Yes. Um, should all building of all kinds stop? I don't think so. Um, should we try to um, have it be such that those who are building in our communities um, are, uh, are participants and who and are actively engaged in, uh, in connecting, in consulting, and not just consulting as like a, a, a uh, a box ticking exercise, but like getting in there, being a, because like, like, you know, I'm sure many of us come from, you know, rural communities or have like our uh, grandparents or so it might, might be from rural communities where, you know, 20 people from the community went and built the community hall or, you know, they all got together and like built something because they saw purpose in that. Um, and, and now that, uh, that labor is specialized and it's, um, it's, it's delegated to, uh, to a professional um, specialization. Um, but I think we should still take that same sort of approach, that we as a community want this, so let's build it. Hey, you guys are the professionals, let's have you build it. And I, like, so I don't think that the developers have to be demons, but I, I do agree with you that, if, that the notion that the free market will take care of all, or especially as uh, Melissa very poignantly described, um, when those you know rich uh, the regulations can uh, can favor uh, capital, can favor class, can favor race, or disfavor um, any of those same categories, um, that uh, that yeah we, we need to we need to take uh, take care about that and yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess we have. Well, I, I just wanted to ask, like, I was wondering what you two thought about, you know, um, restaurants like Juniper or Kisa Tonto moving into the neighborhood. Um, that's a good question. These are trendy restaurants that, um, you know, it's a, one, a Kisa Tonto is a, a Italian and Japanese fusion, and it's become very popular, it's written about quite a bit. Um, I do not personally, um, I do not personally police businesses um, that come into Chinatown. Um, the question whether or not 
these businesses have a role. These businesses have a role in gentrifying Chinatown. Um, it, they probably do, um, plain and simple, because they are more expensive than what was previously offered, and that brings in a certain set of people who can afford that. That raises property values. That raises rents. That makes it inaccessible. However. Um, we do have this discussion of um, also, what do you need to price your food at? What do you need to um, pay your workers? What is your economy of your space such that you're paying people in a fair way? Now, the owner of, say, Quesatento, I don't know all the economies of, of her personal business, but um, I am told that she pays her workers fairly. She pays her kitchen staff more than fair. She shops locally. Um, and so if that price, if commanding that price is what you need to pay people properly, then we also have to wonder, you know, are we, the only reasons why so many affordable places can exist um, so affordably is because they're, probably not paying someone properly, right? Um, and I don't want to, um, there's like this big discussion also like um, that's related about um, ghettoizing racialized food, right? That we're not paying enough for it and people are not willing to pay enough for this, types of, for this type of food and their workers are, you know, at a, you know, there was a time and moment when you know, all of your staff or your family, so you could exploit them like with minimal <laughs> <laughs> consequence, I guess. Um, Builds character. <laughs> Andy does. <laughs> Andy had it his moment. Um, so we do have to have these serious conversations about um, what are the prices that that we need to be seeing on the menus. Right, um, that lead to fair wages. Um, it, does that lead to gentrification? Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is like um, it, it, it's a whole. It, it's not just a Chinatown plan, right? It's not just a Punjabi market plan. It's like citywide, regionally understanding these economics, regional economics, right, and how to make this work. Um, it's it's a tough conversation, yeah. That's ongoing, certainly really ongoing in, in our communities. Um, so that's how I feel or not feel about them. Well, in the Punjabi market, um, I was there the other day and I, I spoke to one of the owners of a business. And I said, you know, uh, you know, there's all these developments coming in and uh, like ore development, and they're going to have market rentals on top, and then there's going to have retail on the bottom. And, and I said, well, how do you feel about that? You know, it's going to be very different. And do you, do you care what kind of businesses come in? And he said, you know what? We just want foot traffic. It's, it's, got, it's dropped down to the level where it's so far gone, where you know they want people to come. They want to welcome that energy. And they want those entrepreneurs. They want that fusion restaurant. They want those things, right? So it, it's, it's in a different state right now. So, um, to, OK, so two points, foot traffic and fusion. Um, first, um, that was the whole idea behind building condos in Chinatown to begin with. Let's get foot traffic. We need people in Chinatown. There are not enough people. So if people will come, Chinatown will be great. You know? Make Chinatown great again. <laughs> um, that is not happening. What's happening is that people coming to Chinatown are not shopping at the places that we want to protect. And their property taxes and their rents are going up and they become displaced and then places like Juniper that can afford it will come in, right? Um, so it's not just foot traffic that will like save a neighborhood. It, you have to really consider, again, like the economies there. Um, and then second, again with this um, food discussion of fusion, um, 
why is it that people are will more willing to pay for like Asian European fusion? It, it themselves to think about how we can plan not just for cultural diversity but also for economic diversity and especially in, an, in for economic diversity I, I hope that can be a city-wide thing um, and not just oh we'll have economic diversity over there and then economic diversity becomes a particular thing but no the economic diversity should be that should be a, a city-wide um, if not a country-wide um, thing is having having economic diversity and just you know let's put our brains to that and think about how how do we realize that sort of thing and it just to your that was to your question yeah and you know what power to the people you know there's an open house coming up for the Punjabi market I think in July 10th for one of the developments right so um, you know that's the public has a chance to go there and to give their ideas and so that's one of the things that's also happened over the years, and that's what some of these shop owners say, is that, you know, we, wa we want this and we want that, or, you know, and then the city, then they go to the city and they lobby them, and then finally they get their voice heard, and the city says, well, okay, well, give us a plan, tell us what you want. And then, and then they have a problem trying to agree on a plan, too. So, so there are other issues, too. Sometimes there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Sorry, can I just say one more thing about like keeping neighborhoods affordable? I, I didn't like fully flesh out the idea of um, also not only exploiting your family, is the reason why <laughs> things are affordable, but also um, the economy of, of Chinatown is incredibly informal, right? And so you you have your you know meat production facilities and some production your grocers your um, that they know each other. Right? And they can provide each other like actually like very reasonable prices because they have those relationships. What happens when you know you, you push a road down one of those um, you know, like that makes it inaccessible for like a food production place to exist now? Right? You take away that niche spot that that one um, factory had, and then. Um, they have to form a new relationship, and maybe they don't have the same relationship, they don't get the s same deals, right? So it's like a really entrenched, like, um, informal economy that um, the, the city and certainly politicians don't really understand the full force of it, right? And so that's also how you destroy affordability, um, is not only <laughs> exploitation of <laughs> <laughs> Well, because I'm thinking of like Goldstone, right? My favorite place in the world. Um, where both of their kids work there. I, um, I, I grew up like side by side with these kids, me eating pork chop and the kids, you know, learning how to run the restaurant. And they still work there. Um, and um, uh, the daughter actually went to university and it, for a really long time she left and she came back and it's like so nice to see her face like back at the restaurant. But it's also, they get, um, they get their uh, meats from uh, dollar meats, um, also in Chinatown. And then in my other favorite place in, in Richmond, my other favorite Hong Kong cafe, um, I saw uh, their produce truck come in. They also have like really affordable food. And they were also, uh, it, the dollar meats truck was visiting all the way in Richmond and also dropping off like their meat supply, right? So th there are all of these networks of relationships of you know production um, that keep things really affordable. And as soon as you start to you know kill off these places, then all of a sudden they have to form new relationships that maybe are not there. The prices begin to go up, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, seeing the time has passed as well. This has been a really fascinating conversation and I hope that you folks can continue it after this. Uh, I'd like to thank the Indian Summer Festival for hosting this wonderful event and our panelists and a hand for our panelists, please. <laughs> Conversation um, afterwards. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Andy. Thank you. Yeah.